As you see, there has been some partial commutativity here in the, in the talk. Uh, somehow I will speak first, uh, followed by, by uh, my year. It is a complicated uh, uh, mathematical uh, equation to be solved here, but uh, uh, Nushka has helped me with that. And we will add six minutes for the uh, confusion with the machine. So, thank you. Thanks to the organizers for giving me the possibility to tell you a bit about the discrete duality for downset lattices and their residuated operations. Um, rather than presenting any results, I will try to present a research question here, or maybe a research uh, program if you want, um, which we believe is, uh, is interesting and is also central to, I mean, when I came here I didn't know that it was uh, so connected to many things that we did the past few days, but basically the motivation for what we want to do is to find a logic for things which are, which you may call label transition systems, which, which, which go by many names, they look like this. You have um, states, maybe some states to start with, and then some states you can reach by doing certain actions. A, or maybe an action B will let you end up here, but maybe doing the same action A when you're in state S2 will also let you end up in T2. Things like this, which of course look very much like the, all the diagrams and figures we saw uh, the past few days. And what is underlying all this is just, we have a set of states which may also have a partial order on them. So maybe we saw this morning in Bob, Bob's talk that uh, some things come before the other thing in time, or something like that. And then we have possible actions, A star, because we may also do certain actions after each other. And we have then a transition, transitions, which we model as a relation, so a ternary relation uh, going from states using an action to another state. And that's what a label transition system is. And basically what we want to explore is how to get logical descriptions of, of such things. So, and what, what do we want for a logical description? I, have, I should say this is also a, a work that's inspired by work of Marnusius and uh, and that uh, me and my PhD supervisor, my Kirke, are uh, going to try to uh, do while. Well. Uh, yeah. uh, so, what is the logical description? Well, we, we don't want to have negation because what is a negation of an action or what is a negation of a that there is a partial order on the state? So, we don't want to have negation in our logic, but we do want to be able to look back at what we did. So we want to be able to, if we're here in the state T1, we want to be able to say we, we could only have ended up here because we did action A when we were in state S1. Statements like this we want to be able to express in our logic. And, and I think this is, this is uh, what is new to this, um, is that we want the bullet, which is the fusion or the action, or the tensor product maybe, um, uh, is the primitive operation, and I think this is what makes it very much in the spirit of many of the earlier talks that we've seen in these past days. Um, so, so much for the motivation. Now, let me give you some uh, uh, ideas about. So, basically, the first part without negation will be um, why we need to use positive modal logic if you look at the column on the left. Then, um, with converse, will be why we need to use residuation, and then with bullet as a primitive operation, that will be our research question. So that's going to be the build-up of my talk. First I have to tell you some things about discrete duality, then about positive modal logic to be able to deal with logic with no negations, then residuation to do this looking back, and then finally I will be able to tell you what our research question or project is. So I hope to convince you that it's an interesting thing to look at in the end. So discrete duality to start with a hopefully fairly familiar case, Discrete duality, categorical duality, dual equivalence of categories, gives you, for example, Kripke semantics for classical modal logic. And how does it work? Just a brief summary. Um, complete atomic Boolean algebras are just a category with homomorphisms, are just a category du uh, which is equivalent to dually to the category of sets. So I use those arrows to denote a dual equivalence. From a Boolean algebra, which is complete and atomic, you can use its atoms to describe it. And then taking the power set algebra of that will give you that very complete atomic Boolean algebra back. And now what makes it interesting for modal logic is that we have relations on sets. 
And here we were talking about the ternary relation on sets, for now I'm just talking about the binary relation on sets. And this is dual algebraically to a complete operator on the Boolean algebra, where if you have a relation, then the operator is related to it in the way I have there. And now we need some magic to actually get a logic. And I don't want to go into this magic, but this magic is called canonical extension, and it's a very uh, beautiful kind of magic, because what, what does it give you in this case, but it's a very general theory that, that goes, that's about much more than just Boolean algebras, but if you have a Boolean algebra with an operator, where operator means it preserves finite, finite joints, so finitary axioms for your logic, then it embeds in a complete atomic Boolean algebra with a complete operator. So, using this discrete duality, you can then get frame completeness of the logic with finite axioms, so just saying that this diamond operator preserves finite joints, take the canonical extension, use the discrete duality and get frame completeness, so the familiar completeness of modal logic with respect to Kripke frames. That's the classical framework, now a bit less classical, but still, as you can see, fairly classical is discrete duality for um, the analog of complete of Kabas, complete atomic Boolean algebras, but then when you don't have negation. So instead of a Boolean algebra, we have a distributive lattice, but the idea is still the same. Instead of taking the atoms and just a set of atoms, you need to remember a bit more about the distributive lattice. Namely, you need to take the joint prime elements of the lattice and the order on them, and going back, you take the downset lattice of that. So this doubly algebraic is you can formulate it in many ways, you can also call it completely prime algebraic or having enough joint prime elements if you want. Um, but uh, basically it's a, it's those, it's algebraically characterizes those lattices which arise as downset lattices. Just like complete atomic Boolean algebra characterizes what comes up as power set lattices. So, and then the story is completely analogous to what I just told you. So, a complete operator on such a doubly algebraic thing corresponds to a relation on the dual side, so again a binary relation, so one without labels now, on the post set. So this could be the post set, the S1, T1, T2, and the thing without the labels could be one of your relations, except that you have to check that it satisfies this order compatibility. Did you say what doubly algebraic was? Yeah, it's that, uh, that you have enough joint prime elements in the lattice to generate it. So every element of the lattice yeah. is that's, that's what it's equivalent to. Right? Yeah, or it's equivalent, I mean, it's equivalent to many things. So why, why is it doubly algebraic? Because actually, if you know that it's generated by joint primes, because of distributivity, you also know that it's me generated by me primes. So, yeah. You could also state that as you So it's algebraic and, uh, and it's... And do it algebraic. Dual. Okay. It's algebraic. Thank you. So, then we have, a, a, again, this magic that again it's enough to give a finitary, finitary axioms so you can just say you have a diamond which preserves finite joints and then whenever you have such a situation you can embed it in a complete situation where you actually know it's a concrete thing coming from a concrete frame like the one I drew here and um, so the equational theory of distributive lattices with operators is just the same as the equational theory of those complete things. So again you have that discrete duality with the canonical extension magic gives you frame completeness. And now this is what we hope to do also in the uh, research question that I will state as the last part of this talk. So now um, we, we saw it all works very nicely if you only have one diamond. So these structures with these doubly algebraic lattices and one diamond. But now, as is familiar, this diamond says the things you, that there is something you can possibly reach from a state. But you could also look at the box version of a relation, which says that at all states you can reach something holds. And in classical logic, these things are really related by negation. There you have the, the familiar thing that a diamond the diamond operator is just given by not box not. Uh, but in distributive lattice setting we don't know this anymore because we don't have 
negation, so we cannot express this, but there are um, ways to do it still without negation, you can express that a diamond and a box on a lattice come from that very same relation. And that is, was first done by Dunn in 1995, a modal logic in the absence of negation, with both a diamond and a box. Then Chilani and Jan Sana in 1997 gave a Kripke style semantics that was really analogous to the one I've been sketching here. And uh, actually, Gerke Nagahashi and Feynman in 2004 embedded this in a more general framework that gave uh, yeah, distributive lattice based modal logics of any kind you could possibly want, which also encompasses the one where you have a diamond and a box coming from one relation. So, how does it work formally? You say a positive modal algebra, so this is going to define your logic, and as you'll see, it's a very simple, almost propositional logic, just that you have two unary operations which satisfy, well, the box has to distribute over finite meets, the diamond has to preserve finite joints, and then there are these two axioms which have been called the interaction axioms, and those are the ones which replace this fact, the fact that you could have gotten the box from the diamond if you had had negation don't have negation anymore, so you need to say something which still connects, as you can see those axioms connect the box and the diamond. And intuitively if you take the second one, what it says that if it's true somewhere in the future that A holds and everywhere that B holds, then it's true somewhere in the future that A and B holds. Those are very intuitive axioms. So, um, and again, now you can, you can consider the logic generated by this. So the logic, the equational theory of positive modal algebras. And again, the story is the same. You have perfect positive modal algebras, which are those very special concrete ones with a doubly algebraic lattice and the diamond and box preserving arbitrary joints and meets. And again, canonical extension magic gives you an embedding. So automatically, Kripke style semantics says this is the third time I'm saying this, so I'm going through it a bit quickly. Uh, for k plus using the discrete duality that we already saw. So this is what is really nice about this framework is that as soon as you have a discrete duality for a certain class of lattices and you have canonical extensions, you can add as many operations and axioms for these operations. There is a little caveat, the, the, the axioms cannot be very arbitrary, they have to be a bit nice with a reasonably large class of axioms uh, and you get always Kripke style semantics. So now what is a Kripke frame exactly? You have two binary relations now, one for the diamond and one for the box, which satisfy this kind of compatibility axioms that I showed you before, and they satisfy the two red things, which exactly correspond to the two red interaction axioms that I saw. So you see it that I showed you. So it's, it's very modular in adding axioms and adding diamonds and boxes. Now that is the first part, so that is what's going to give us expressiv expressivity, if you want, of this transition system in our logic upwards. But we also, as I said, we also want to be able to look back. And for that, we need to um, consider adjoints or residuation. So resi uh, just in the uh, uh, most easy case, you have a unary diamond, so a diamond, an operation which preserves all joints of your doubly algebraic lattice, and then you know it has an upper adjoint. So, let's see what that meaning of that upper adjoint, which I've denoted by a black box here, what it is. So, we just have a Kripke frame, which corresponds to this white diamond, and what we know for a formula is that it holds, that the diamond of that formula holds at a certain state. As I told you, it means that there is something that's related, that it sees under the R diamond relation, where phi actually holds. That's just modal logic. But now what does the diamond do, or the, sorry, the black box do? That's the upper adjoint of the white diamond. So if we want to understand what x less than or equal to black box of phi means, we use the adjunction property. Diamond x is less than or equal to phi. And then if you write out what it means, you see that everything that sees x has to satisfy phi. And you see here we get a looking back kind of thing, because everything that was before x under the R diamond relation has to satisfy phi. So what we conclude here is that the relation naturally associated to, to the black box is just the converse of the relation as naturally associated to the white diamond. So this is how we get 
looking back. It's by taking algebraically uh, upper edges. And uh, also note that this compatibility criterion that I had for the R diamond completely transforms to a compatibility criterion for the black box that we have here. So this will be important in a moment when I move to binary operations where these compatibility criteria make it become a bit more complicated, but the principle is going to be the same. Because now I made a little table to give you an idea. I mean, this is fairly classical, looking back in the binary case. But now, as I told you, what we have here with these labels is actually a ternary relation, right? We, we are also putting labels on those arrows and actually to make it interesting, maybe I should put multiple arrows here, so maybe you can also go to uh, T1 using an action B, right? So, there may be many things, so it's really a ternary relation. And what does that correspond to dually? Well, it corresponds to a binary fusion. And this is where the fusion comes in, and a binary fusion corresponds to a ternary relation, like the one I've drawn here, but it has to satisfy this order compatibility again. And now we may wonder in the same way that we did with the unary one, what are the uh, relations dual to its upper adjoints? Because this binary, this fusion, will, will preserve joints in each coordinate, so it will have an upper adjoint in the first coordinate if you fix the second one, and vice versa. So we get again upper adjoints, which are denoted by the slash and the backslash that you might recognize also from uh, Michal Mur uh, talk from yesterday. So it's very, uh, yeah. And of course you can go on with this and do it maybe for enary uh, functions. If you had a fusion which took like n uh, inputs and you would have n upper adjoints depending on which coordinates you fix. Now what does that, what does taking the residual mean for the relation that we have? Well, we have um, we can, we can do some calculations. This is what taking the adjoint means in an algebraic style. And with a calculation similar to the unary case, what you see, for example, for this slash, one way is that a state satisfies the backslash of phi 2 and phi 1, if and only if, well... You have the slashes the long way around. Okay, I have the slash, sorry. I have the slashes, that's, okay, the slashes maybe um, then this should be the forward slash and then you get this formula so for all um, states if you have two states which are in the future but here's actually the x1 in this example would be for example an action A via which you can get to T1 and if this is in a certain collection of actions now then that implies that T1 satisfies phi 2 so the phi 1 is a, maybe a property of actions, right? So what we see is that the, luckily I didn't write out what the actual, or the compatibilities were, so this statement is still correct. The r slash and the r backslash are, uh, are permutations of the rf, exactly as we had in the unary case where we only had one way to do converse, but here they are like, yeah, permutations of the inputs. And you can write compatibility axioms for them, so the R bullet is order compatible again with the R slash and the R forward slash. R. So what do we see now? I come to uh, to the to the question. Uh, we want to combine this positive modal logic and residuation into one framework, where the the bullet, the, the the fusion, is the primitive symbol. So in positive modal logic, we had that two negation dual operations, but we didn't know anymore that they were negation dual, came from one binary relation by taking the converse. You, uh, sorry, by, by taking really the same relation but to having those interaction axioms. Now with residuation we have n residuated operations from one enary relation. So the obvious question to ask is can we get enary positive modal logic with residuated operations? So can we do the same kind of thing but where those di white diamond and white box may be uh, yeah, you may have more than one input, maybe more than unary. And then to uh, link back to the project of uh, uh, finding dynamic epistemic logic, because this is related to dynamic logic, because you can uh, well do updates by actions, basically. And 
then you also want to be able to actually, that the system can reason about those updates, so it, it knows, it may know about updates or not. And so we then, in the end, after doing this first part, we would also want to add epistemic modalities to this system. So other diamonds and other boxes which represent the knowledge of agents about what is happening here. And I think that is uh, going to be an interesting project uh, that I wanted to present to you today. So thank you very much. It's time for two short uh, questions, I think. Back there. So what are the logical operations you have? Like, do you have implication as well in the positive mode logic? In, sorry? In the positive mode logic. Do you just have conjunction and disjunction? Or do you have yes. Only conjunction and disjunction, which, which satisfy distributive logic. Yeah.